Coming up on Chopper's Brexit podcast. Are you secretly a Remainer? Um, absolutely. Oh um, my God, the but, man who invented Brexit is a Remainer. It's the curious twist of fate in the world. Brexit is happening. This time next week, we'll be on the verge of a whole new relationship with our European friends. A countdown clock will be shortly projected onto the walls of Downing Street. Boris Johnson will make a special address on Friday night to the nation. A special 50p coin will enter circulation to mark the occasion. And, yep, I'll be in the Red Lion pub, as ever, recording this very podcast going out at 1 minute past 11, the moment of leaving the European Union. It's a landmark event. But 10 years ago, the word Brexit didn't exist. And today, it's inescapable. So on this episode, I'll be talking to four people for whom that word has had a profound effect on their working lives. I'll be joined by Peter Wilding, the sister who invented the word and then came to regret it. I'll be joined by Rory Stewart, the former International Development Secretary, who lost the Tory whip because of his aversion to the no-deal Brexit, then stood for the Tory leadership and is now running as an independent candidate for London Mayor. Financial writer Dominic Frisby will tell me why he's turned his pen towards singing about Brexit. But first up, I'm joined by stalwart of the Brexit campaign, the godfather of Brexit, Sir Bill Cash. And he's here to tell me about his 35 years in Parliament fighting for the UK to leave the European Union. Sir Bill won his 10th election victory in 2019. That's 10th election victory. He was the founder of the Maastricht referendum campaign in the early 1990s. And he's just been elected again chairman of the House of Commons European Scrutiny Committee. If anybody knows what it's like to keep banging the Brexit drum over a period of decades, it's him. So Bill Cash, welcome to Chopper's Brexit podcast. Morning. You're grinning. I am. I'm, very, well, I'm grinning. Uh, but no, you're always happy, happy normally. But why I, are you happier than normal? Well, because we're getting royal assent today. I know. I mean, this is a, a very, is this is a definitive moment. The, this is the historic moment. The withdrawal agreement bill, which brings into force the, the idea of leaving the European Union, is being signed off by the Queen today. That's right. And on the 31st of January, we leave. And yeah. that's it. And how do you feel? Because I've got to say, you are... As we were only walking over here, you were telling me you're the grandfather of the House of Commons because you are the oldest member of Parliament, <laughs> and you're the godfather of Brexit. Well, it's for others to say what they like, but they, all <laughs> I can say is that uh, it's been a very long and extremely interesting, fascinating journey. I've been at it now for 35 years. Well, I should tell the readers this. You joined Parliament, didn't you, in 84, Four. at a by-election, yeah. yes. and then you became a member of the European Scrutiny Committee in 85? 85, yes. That's right, and since then you've been a member of this committee, this single committee. So basically you've been a member of that committee for nearly as long as we've been in the European Union, <laughs> scrutinising these directives. Well, actually, somebody once said to me, I think I'm the longest-standing member of any select committee in yes. li living memory. But actually, um, to staying with it and now being chairman for the last 10 years yes. has really been incredibly important in yes. terms of my understanding of what's going on yes. and also, of course, meeting people all over Europe. Well, it's without equal your knowledge of the European Union and what it does. Before we go into the detail, what will you do on the, the 1st of February? Your uh, life's work's accomplished. Well, I will certainly, drop. I, I will certainly breathe an enormous sigh of relief. That's the first <laughs> thing. The second thing is I should be looking forward to yes, where we're going the, in the, the future. Trade, the trade yeah. deal, of course, of course. But it's quite a moment. It's a, it's a punctuation mark in it, your it's life. It's a constitutional moment. That is the key issue. And it's about yeah. sovereignty and it's about democracy. Yeah. And above all else, it's a tribute to the British people because they are the ones mm. who voted to leave on the 23rd of June yeah. um, in 2016. And in fact, in the general election, they re-endorsed that. So for practical purposes, those are, to me, the greatest moments, which are the democratic decision of the, of the British moments. people. The peop yes. People believe in democracy. Yes. It's a democratic decision. I mean, it's quite you know, a moving thing. It is emotional, uh, but actually you can't allow the emotion to get no. in the way of the persistence and the determination and the political will. Mm -hmm. But actually it's a, it's a gradual process. It always was a gradual process. It now is a final process. Okay, when did you first become an outer? Uh, I would say in 1986. That uh, long ago, you yes, were an outer? I, I put down the amendment uh, on the Single European Act, which... Uh, 
in a nutshell, said nothing in this act shall derogate from the sovereignty of the United Kingdom Parliament. And it's that act that moved away from the common market principles into more of a, of a political it, union. It was much more, in other words, it vastly increased the amount of qualified majority voting in crucial areas. It diminished our influence. And, and it diminished our influence for a very simple reason, that the decisions that are taken by the Council of Ministers are taken behind closed doors, and believe it or not, and many people don't know this, mm. without even a transcript of what is said and done. So for practice, practical purposes, it is essentially an undemocratic system, and that's what did it. But this amendment, interestingly, I wasn't allowed to debate at all no. in the House of Commons. Now, the very words that I used in that amendment are almost exactly replicated in the Withdrawal Agreement Act, as it will be today. Is that your doing? Um, Yes, it was. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I can only tell you. Drafters. I can only tell you that um, there was a, there was a strong sense that what I'd said then was ought, ought to be replicated now. Accurate. Yeah. When did Better Off Out start? That was the group when I first started covering politics over a decade ago. Better Off Out was about a, a fringe group of slightly, you know, off the wall politicians who were never going to get their way, but, but it was a group. But that was the technique that they had to employ because there was so much at stake. Mm. It's about who governs Britain. Mm. It's as simple as that. You had to mock them. And you had to mock them. You had to make them sound boring. You had to make them sound as if they were wacky um, and completely in a minority. And actually, in truth, back in when, when, when I led the Maastricht Rebellion mm. in, the 90s, uh, in, in, in early 1990s, I mean, you only have to look at the... Uh, division list to see that there were on the whole only about 19 to 20 people who are actually taking part in the votes against well, the government the whole time. I mean, how close did we come to losing this Brexit last year? I mean, in journalism, the Telegraph was the only newspaper which yes. said don't back the meaningful vote three. Well, that is in completely March, true. April. I mean, the, the, and there were about thirty-one Spartans holdouts, weren't there, in the yeah. ERG, of which you were one. Yes, the, the the Telegraph has been incredibly important because it's brought to bear to a wider audience and in the letters column, mm. uh, but also in the leaders and the commentator and Charles Moore, mm. Philip Johnson, and so on, really understanding what this is all about, and actually with I, what I would regard as extremely. Uh, responsible and mm. explaining what to the British people mm. or to, to the Telegraph readers what yes, it's about. But the heat on those was it? How, how many in the Spartan group? Uh, twenty-seven or twenty-eight. Those twenty MPs. The pressure on them was quite something last year. Well, it really was. Um, and of course, the pressure the other way was that we realised that, that the whole of our governmental system was being held to ransom by recalcitrant Conservative colleagues, as well as by the uh, Labour Party and the SNP and so on. But actually, we were in a state of complete paralysis. Mm. And the question was, how on earth were we going to get out of that? And the only way was to have a general election. That's right. Those recalcitrant colleagues you mentioned there... Philip Hammond, former Chancellor, Rory Stewart, who's on this podcast later. They're basically Tories, but they couldn't agree with you on Brexit and it became a defining thing in their lives, didn't it? Yes, but you see, the trouble is that they, they didn't seem to grasp the simple point that this was about democracy and sovereignty. And the two things I said in the House at the time uh, run together. Mm. If you have a democratic system, you can actually have your sovereignty and vice versa. Mm. And the whole essence of this argument at the bottom, is about who governs this country. You can't get anything bigger. Mm. And it, uh, it's over than politics, yeah. even than being a Tory or a Labour MP, well, isn't it, it? That is exactly the point. And actually, this was not a party political question. When people went to vote in the referendum, they weren't saying, oh, I'm Labour, therefore I'm going to do this, or I'm Conservative. No, they actually made a decision, as I said in the House last week, uh, at breakfast or the, the night before, as a family, what are we going to do? Irrespective of party politics, they went out because they had a, a view, they had a, a, a sense of their own identity and their own wish to, gov to, to govern themselves. And how was that forgotten by the, well, the government really last year? Well, how because they're so completely caught up in, in the minutiae, they didn't see the wood for the trees. Mm. And they, in fact, never have done, except for those if you go back to the 60s and 70s, who absolutely wanted to go into the European Union at pretty well any price. Yeah. And they were prepared to surrender yeah. the self-government of the United Kingdom yeah. to a system that they knew yeah. was going to end up that in... It's extraordinary that you say they couldn't see the wood for the trees because 
forgive me, but critics of yours would say you couldn't see the wood for the trees when you were going about details of uh, and, and, the, ah. and the detail of the directives and what it means for Britain and all, all well, the detail of, of EU legislation can, in but, the old days. Well, it's a very interesting point because it's only when you actually address the question of how the directives are made and the manner in which they're it's done awesome. behind closed doors, it's undemocratic. If you take the ports regulation as a very good example, that was something a couple of years ago which actually was... Uh, opposed by every trade union around the ports, all 34 port employers, and we co- it was going through the House of Commons and we couldn't do anything to stop it. Mm-hmm. So, Bill Cash, looking forward, do you think we can get a trade deal with the, mm-hmm. with the US by July, as ministers want, and with the EU by, the, by, by Christmas? Well, I think there will be parallel negotiations, mm-hmm. um, and I believe at the same time what's going to happen uh, is that because the EU have an enormous interest uh, in making sure that this goes well, and I'm, you can hear sounds off uh, on programmes now indicating, as there was this morning on Thursday morning, uh, somebody from the, to the European Commission suggesting that actually, yes, that there was going to be a negotiation, and somebody even saying that they could do it even in a shorter time than the end of the year. Just looking back finally over the past three years and with the two <clears> prime ministers we had, do you think... We needed the, the chaos under Theresa May, the trying to get a degree of compromise that you couldn't really do given the binary vote and that kind of I failure think, created the, the conditions for Boris Johnson I, I, to I, deliver Brexit. I, I think that is a very, very shrewd political mm. observation. Mm. Um, I, I think you need a catharsis in order to create, out of the apparent chaos the clarity that was needed to ensure that we got the right answer. Yes. And it was the realisation amongst Labour members as well. Don't forget that the, 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 yes. the, the, there were a number of Labour members. Half a dozen or so. Uh, half a dozen or so. And, of course, there were others in the Labour Party yeah. who took the same view. And above all else, I pay tribute again to the British public and to those people in the Labour Leave marginals. It was the people who made the decision yeah. in the general election. And on Twitter, we asked this morning, for any questions for you, Sir Bill Cash. And Rogers asked, did you ever imagine it was going to be Boris who'd deliver Brexit? I mean, a year ago, Boris was nowhere. He wasn't in the government. He was just, you know, people were saying he could be the guy, could be the next PM, but no chance of that a year ago. And now he did it. I was discussing these very same questions with Boris in cafes and restaurants when he was the Brussels correspondent. And I really mean that. In the, uh, oh, late, no, late I made 80s, no mistake, 90s. he understood it. And there was some resistance from the editorial team in the Daily Telegraph at that time amongst certain people. But the, the thrust of the te- Telegraph was to do the right thing for the right reason. And that is why the Telegraph has been consistent. And at the same time, Boris, above all else, had the knowledge to be able to see if I may say, the wood for the trees again, because he knows exactly what is at stake. And there is a Churchill factor here. And he has the capacity and is demonstrating by the decisions that he's taking. And he's not only growing into the job, but has already demonstrated a degree of statesmanship, uh, which certainly is illustrated by, as far as I'm concerned, what I saw Mm. when he was a a fairly young correspondent back in uh, the Daily Telegraph all those years ago. So, Bill Cash, on this day of jubilation for you, on the day when the bill was passed, Thank you for coming on Chopper's Brexit podcast. The Godfather of Brexit, Sir Bill Cash. Thank you. Thank you. Well, clearly Brexit has played a key role, a defining role in Sir Bill's political career. And what struck me there was this feeling of, I thought, uh, a weight lifting from his shoulders. He seemed relaxed and perhaps happier than I've ever seen Bill Cash in all the many years I've known him. This really is a life's work, uh, an achievement uh, by getting out of the European Union, for better, for worse. That was the guy who made it happen to a large extent. But for every politician for whom Brexit has propelled them forward, there are others for whom the idea of leaving without a deal, a no-deal Brexit, was a clear red line. Now, Rory Stewart was one of 21 Tory MPs who had the whip withdrawn last year when they voted against the government to block a no-deal Brexit. Not long after that, he announced his resignation from the party and said he'd be running as an independent candidate for London mayoralty. The election for that is in May. And Rory Stewart joins me now in the Red Lion pub. Rory, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for breakfast. Yeah, not at all. You've had quite a few months of it, haven't you? I mean, you've become the DFID secretary and you very kindly gave us your first ever interview in your office 
which is a lot about you as an individual. You didn't pull out after you were promoted from being prison minister. When you ran for the Tory leadership, and then you, you stood down as an MP to challenge to be London mayor. I mean, it's been an amazing 12 months for you, hasn't it? Incredibly exciting. And actually, this is probably the most fulfilling thing I've done. This podcast. Uh, your podcast. Oh, sorry. Your, your podcast and your breakfast is amazing. <laughs> but I guess maybe even more amazing uh, is running to be London Mayor because it's giving me the chance to just be out hour in, hour out, sometimes staying with people, sometimes just having coffees with them in all these different boroughs of London. And it's such a, a release because when you are a uh, member of the National Security Council, a cabinet minister, or even any kind of minister, you're locked behind a desk a lot. And your big announcement this week is about neighbourhood policing, isn't it? I think crime is one of the big issues of the first half of this year at a national and a local level. I think it's one of the things everyone's worrying about post-Brexit. Well, it's shocking. The new statistics have just come out. It's up again. It must be gripped. And we need a very, very simple direction, which is we will reduce crime. In my case, I would do what I did in prisons, which is to say, I'm going to reduce violence unless I resign. If I hadn't reduced violence by 16% in seven months in prisons, I would have resigned. I'll do the same for London. And we the know mayor, the mayor's job essentially is a transport job and a crime job, isn't it? Absolutely. That's the, what it is, really. The mayor is the police and crime commissioner for London. So what you want is a mayor who says, this is my job. Mm. If crime's going wrong, that's my responsibility. I'm going to sort it out. Instead mm. of which, what we have is an endless blame game. They're perpetually blaming austerity or cuts for this and the other. Truth of the matter is, yes, there is a problem on resources. But the mayor, for some reason, chose not to bring in any extra police himself. He's got a huge budget. And he's got a budget which is bigger than the budget of 76 countries. Mm. A lot of power in that job. Extraordinary. And there are some pretty straightforward he, things he's he distracted do. by things that aren't core, do you think? I think there's a. it's one of the big revelations. It's one of the reasons I became an independent and left party politics. I think party politicians are drawn all the way towards sound bites, so three words that you can put on a cap, thinking about... Get Brexit done. Get Brexit done and talking very generally about values. I want to fix the signalling on the Piccadilly line. I want to make sure I know exactly how many officers there are in each ward. Make sure that we have a sergeant, two police constables, three PCSOs. It's the details that change things in life. And let voters know that ratio so they can say, where is the sergeant, where are the PCOs, and see it and report back to you. Absolutely. And they should be entitled to know the number, the face. They should be familiar with these people because good policing begins with communities. It's founded in communities, getting those relationships right. That's where intelligence comes from. That's how you do stop and search well without alienating communities, and that's how you drive down crime. Can you beat the system? You're up against candidates for the Tory party and Labour, and you're on your own. You've got some really good advisors around you, but you're on your own doing it. Can you do that? The trick is to be out seeing as many people as possible. In my experience, if I'm given a fair chance for somebody to assess me as an individual against Sadiq Khan and against the other candidates, Generally speaking, people will conclude I've got a better plan, I've got a better track record, I can get things done. But the key is, can I get out to enough people between now and May to have a fair chance of people looking at that offer and saying, this is the it's, man with the police plan, he can make London safe. It's normally above party politics, isn't it? And it's also won by someone who's known by their first name, Boris, Ken, Sadiq less so, and Rory. If I said Rory to a man in the street, they'd say Rory Stewart, not Rory a racing car, which my kids might say, but Rory Stewart. That's so we've got to keep that. So you, you win down, N- name down recognition there. is important. And then f- attaching that to action. Difficult thing to say in politics, but in the end, it's not about talk, it's about getting things done. How are you feeling about Brexit? So we're, we're meeting, aren't we, on the day that the Queen will sign off the withdrawal agreement bill, the one which was such a headache for you when you were an MP for, for Penrith in, in the last parliament. Are you depressed? Excited? Are you past the point of worrying about Brexit? Well, my, my main objective was to make sure that we got a moderate, pragmatic Brexit and above all, that we stopped a no-deal Brexit. So I threw my career and I resigned ultimately and I voted to stop a no-deal Brexit and we succeeded. And the Prime Minister got a better deal than I thought he could get out of Brussels. You said so, didn't you? You said it wouldn't be reopened. Absolutely. Like everyone thought, to be fair, we all thought that in the summer. Absolutely. And he did it and he's taking it through. The question now for London is how do we really get the most out of this and make Brexit work for London? And again... That's not about pointing out, you know, I voted Remain, that's true, but we got to move on and we got to look at the details. What kind of immigration system do we need? How are we going to work with the City of London? What are the opportunities for London in this new world? And then a bigger issue. All these parties, Conservative Labour, are sounding a bit anti-London now. If you look at their manifestos, it's all about the north of England. In fact, you've got 
Treasury ministers writing papers saying they're going to change the entire investment calculation so that you can't put money into London projects. They don't mention Crossrail 2. We've got to challenge that because London is the engine of this economy. Mm. Very rapidly growing. Isn't it too growing. dominant, though, in England? The, you know, Scotland and Wales, it's, it straws in talent. It becomes its own mini economy. Always a question of balance. So, yes, of course, there are some really great investment projects we need to do in the north. And the most important one is the Leeds-Manchester line. But unless you keep London motoring, the whole country suffers. Mm. London transfers £35 billion a year to the rest of the country. So you've got to get the housing in, you've got to get the infrastructure in to keep the whole British economy. And city regulation, at the start of the Brexit process, one of the big issues was city regulation. It then got forgotten, didn't it, over the final two years of the mm. past three years. But I think that will become a big issue this year, won't it? Huge issue. And again, it's all about the detail. So if I were mayor, it's all about championing the different parts of London with the government, but also in Brussels, to make sure we get the best we possibly can Your out of this deal. Sean Bailey for the Tories, Sadiq Khan for Labour, they haven't got that detail, that knowledge of the... That um, area, you think? So far, we're not seeing that detail. What we're seeing at the moment is they take big ideological party positions for or against. And sometimes, I'm afraid, you know, some people say, well, I don't like Brexit. I'm going to bury my head in the sand, pretend it's not going to happen and just keep complaining about it. Got to be constructive. Got to be pragmatic. You're diff- for me, you're a different politician in this age. You are different to most politicians I ever meet. And you seem to, you know, this could be the job which suits you because it sits above party politics. I think Sadiq Khan isn't really, he often seems a Labour um, I know that he is Labour, and so was Boris and Ken Lemis yeah. before him, but I think it's a what job that transcends party. Yeah, I think, and I found probably the way I was able to make most difference and was in my most independent job, which was prisons minister, where I was able to come in to a very, very difficult system and say I'm going to resign unless I reduce violence, then bring that violence down by 70% in seven months. And the reason I felt I could help people most in those jobs is that my skill set is very operational. Mm-hmm. Iraq, Afghanistan, starting my career in the army. I love getting on and doing things. And the thing that frustrated me in the cabinet is too much talk, not enough action. What's your number on on crime? How much will that fall by or else you'll resign? Have you got a figure in your head? Well, I want to sit down with you, journalists, public, police officers, and and agree a fair figure. Because what I don't want is people coming back saying, you're playing with statistics, you've chosen the dodge. So let's take an open process, let's consult. But absolutely no doubt, you will see when I'm mayor, Crime reducing year on year and detection rates going up. And I want to be judged on that. And if I don't deliver it, I will resign. And just on the big issue of today and and the past three years on Brexit, are you a rejoiner or are you, you're out? We're all out now. No, no, we we are out. We're out. I mean, who knows what would happen in 20, 30 years time. But the key point is making it work outside the European Union. And for me, that means the closest relationship diplomatically, economically that we can get with Europe but also opening up to the rest of the world. How do we take opportunities in China? How do we take opportunities in the United States? And how do we get the detail right? Because it's not about in Europe, out of Europe. It's about the how. Mm. Tariffs, quotas, trading deals. Uh, Getting, for example, for London, the great IT specialists from Europe in to keep our computers going. And on Brexit, we've also been talking about Mexit or Megxit this week. You know Prince Harry very well, didn't you? You tutored the prince's maths, didn't you, uh, for Prince Charles? What's your view on Megxit and Prince Harry's woes at the moment? Are you offering advice to him? Well, I think the, the most fundamental rule for anybody who's a teacher with their pupil is to keep confidential anything that you have with your pupil. I thought he was a wonderful young man, but I owe it to him not to gossip about him. Fair enough. Roy Stewart, thank you so much for coming on Chopper's Brexit podcast. Thank you very much. Right, don't go anywhere. In just a moment, I'll be joined by the man who invented the word Brexit and finding out why he wishes he hadn't. Right after this. Hello, listeners. I'm Danny Boyle, just interrupting Chopper to introduce myself. I'm The Telegraph's Commuter Editions Editor, which means it's my job to provide you with great journalism that makes your journey to and from work as enjoyable as possible. I can't prevent train delays or guarantee you won't get caught in the rain, but I can make sure you're up to date with the best of The Telegraph every morning and evening. My colleague Chris Price and I produce briefings to bring you up to speed in just two minutes at both ends of the day. Now, they're also available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Just search The Briefing or follow the link in the show notes to this episode. From gastro pub to glamping, from Oxbridge to Botox, we Brits love a portmanteau. A new word, even a word podcast. But none has become quite so ubiquitous in recent years as, you've guessed it, the word Brexit. 
and I'm very pleased to be joined by the man who invented that word, Peter Wilding. Peter's a former solicitor in EU law, former media director of the UK's Conservative Party, and former advisor to the then British Prime Minister, David Cameron. Peter Wilding, welcome to the podcast, which would have a different name, but for you. Yeah. <laughs> welcome, That's Peter. Right. Nice to see you. Now, you're now Brexit director at FBC, which is a law firm. Peter, walk us through this word, this word Brexit, this, uh, this six-letter word that you invented. 2012, the Olympics. Oh, Everything was a, going wonderfully. Yes. Uh, except for Greece. Yes. Because they were in a hole. Yes. And an American banker... Well, we were pondering whether we bailed them out, weren't we? We were. In this country. And George Osborne said, should we do that kind of thing? And the word for that was Grexit, the Greek exit from the euro. And I wrote an article in May 2012, which was called Stumbling Towards the Brexit. It didn't take a great leap of imaginative or poetic license to convert Grexit into Brexit. Mm. But the point of that article having been Cameron's man in Brussels, was that I said, unless Britain takes a leadership role in Europe, at the very least to complete the single market, then without political leadership, mm. we could be stumbling towards the Brexit. Where did, your, uh, where did your article appear? Was it online? or? Yeah, it was an online article for a uh, Brussels operation called Your Active. And it was May 2012. The Economist went with Brexit. Was Brexit the it thing It was then? Brexit then. So... so um, the Charlemagne column, and, you know, so it's going to be Brexit. Well, Charlemagne, that's the, the economist. Yeah, and it was David Rennie, great journalist. I know David, yeah. And uh, But that didn't catch on, and nor did I think anything was going to catch on. Until and it, it was proved it was the first use of the word Brexit. I think Sky News did some searching on this, didn't they? They did. And, and they actually, the Oxford the... English Dictionary rings me up about a month after the referendum and says, hey, 2016 word of the year, Brexit, it's your word. How do you feel? And I said, what? Because <laughs> uh, I didn't know, because it really didn't come into currency um, until well, I've got just some, before I've got or after. Some, some figures on that. I was, I was searching the word Brexit on yeah. Factiva UK sources. It was used about a few hundred times in 2013. And that, and that went up to about you know, several several thousand times last year, more than twice the, the NHS references. I mean, it became a national obsession. The NHS is one national obsession. Well, this is that on steroids. That's right. But the tragedy is you can't copyright a word. No. Otherwise, the Daily Telegraph might be, you know, the next purchase I would make. You, you wouldn't be on this podcast. You'd be, uh, you'd be in tr trotters up in the Maldives, well, wouldn't you? you know, you would do, but you can't copyright a word. No. So that's the sad case. So I give it to the nation. Do you? <laughs> would it be on your epitaph? Probably. The man who invented Brexit. Yeah. No, there are other things more to be rest, rest in not peace. We're getting past the word Brexit, aren't we, of course? Brexit's... Uh, a word which, you know, it was used on Wednesday by Boris Johnson in his Facebook uh, uh, Q&A with the, with the people. He's giving a speech the, the, the Monday or Tuesday, I think, after the Brexit day on the 31st, at which he will not mention the word Brexit. It will be a word not spoken ever again, Peter. Uh, How will you, you cope know, with that? You can't control this because no. unlike um, Pollyanna Bill earlier on, I don't see everything going smoothly over the next week. That's Bill or Cash, months. you mean? That's Bill Cash. And, you know, I know full well that this ain't going away, no matter if you want to... Peter, I'm going to ask you a question now, which makes me nervous. Go Are on. you secretly a Remainer? Um, absolutely. Oh, um, my God. The man who invented Brexit is a Remainer. It's a curious twist of fate in the world. But i tell you something. <laughs> Somebody, they, people ask Hang me this on, question. I'm going to pause. Yeah. A moment's silence there, because listen, listen to this podcast will be concerned. They won't <laughs> believe this. They'll be, they'll be pulling over on the hard shoulder in their cars. They'll be putting their coffee down and contemplating the man who invented, who invented the word Brexit is Remainer. Irony of ironies. <laughs> and you haven't, hasn't changed your view the past three years of chaos? Well, actually, um, I accepted the referendum result, and I did two things. I wrote a book called What Next? Britain's Future in Europe. And I said, look, can we discuss Brexit in a much better bigger picture than how many business we try and stop leaving and how many immigrants we try and stop coming. This is massive. It is... It's sovereignty. It's everything. As Bill yeah. Cash said earlier, it's everything. But sovereignty doesn't stop with getting it. You have to have sovereignty for a reason. And what I think your listeners, and I think the country, are really disgruntled about is 650 people across the way there have never once said Brexit. This is about Britain doing something differently. And I think the reason is, is that Bill, Cash and others have a vision. But it's like Oscar Wilde's story of love. It's the policy that dare not, dare not speak its name. 
because having been in Conservative politics since 1979 when I joined the party... And you, and you stood to be an MP, didn't you, in, in some absolutely. elections? Absolutely. And here we are sitting in Westminster, and the think tanks then, in the 1990s, the Adam Smith Institute, it was quite clear what these people wanted. They wanted to complete Margaret Thatcher's revolution. And to do that, they wanted to create a market state. And a market state is a perfectly legitimate idea. The Singapore on steroids well, concept. Well, they liked the common market before it became different in the EU. Well, slightly different because the whole purpose of common market was scale. Mm. Singapore on steroids is we can be as small as we want as long as we're agile and nimble. The tragedy, I think, with Brexit is no statesman has stood up and said Brexit means that we are going to become a major market state, we're going to be open for business. And that means that this NHS, you mentioned the word NHS, I completely foresee over the next 10 years, when Boris Johnson is Prime Minister, that private provision will go from 7% slowly upwards with American health care coming but in. But the, the Tories wouldn't do that. But that, That's the attack line that they always hit hard at the, Wait at the election. See. Wait and see. Because in our day, back in you know Cameron's time or previously... Tories were about economics. Now they're about something fundamentally different. It's populism. And so you can distract well, from the sure. policy. I think, I think you'll find the party moving back towards the kind of dealing with these, the red wall concerns, the, now they would call the blue wall concerns after yeah. the last, well, like, last time month. Will tell. But the point about Brexit is it has to be for a radical it's reason. It's control, isn't it? It's control for what reason? For people here. So civil servants here can't hide behind the apron strings of, of Brussels. They've got to do everything for themselves, including the politicians. They can't blame Brussels for a third of the laws anymore. It's all done by them. It's on them now. You're right. I mean, this is what's going to be the real proof of the pudding about that place over there, yeah. Whitehall, Westminster. You're, you're pointing at the Parliament, I'm aren't you? I'm pointing at the Parliament because, frankly, it has been a bit of a disgrace. And, you know, it is ex- Brexit has done one thing yeah. for everybody. It's exposed the spinelessness, lack of statesmanship and vision at the heart of British democracy. So Bill can say, let's bring back sovereignty and democracy, but it's in the hands of I mean, people. I'm not sure he's thought of, of everything in the future, but he's just <laughs> no. slightly can't believe he's got to where he's he is it. after 35 years. Yeah. Now, Peter, I've got a list here of other words, a bit like Brexit. I want you to define them for us. Right. What is a fix-it? What is a fix-it? Correct. Um, it's a something you fix. No, it's the possibility of Finland leaving the European oh, Union. Of course, right, right. Peter, come oh, on. Sorry. What is Mexit? Mexit. Well, I think that's Meghan Markle's disappearance from the UK, isn't it? No, no, that's Mexit. Mexico leaving NAFTA? No, it's Lionel Messi retiring from international <laughs> football. <laughs> Everything. This is by my, my colleague Theo got these. They're fantastic. What is Califexit? California leaving the United there States. There we go. I'll give you two marks so far. Thank you. Trexit. Trexit. Tre, 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 pass. <laughs> this is when a US resident decides to leave the, the US because of Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Trumped. Listen, you've done more than most of us in a lifetime. You've invented a word which defined a period of our history which will never be forgotten. On that note, I congratulate you, Peter Wilding. Thank you for coming on Chopper's Brexit Podcast. Thanks for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Now, my final guest is marking Brexit by trying to get his new single to number one in the hit parade. Dominic Frisby claims to be the world's only flatter writer and comedian. By day, he writes about commodities and currencies, and by night, he performs stand-up and writes his own songs, the latest of which is causing my producer, Theo, some stress, with the amount of bleeps she'll have to insert when I say what it's called. That's right, the song is called Let's Get 17 Million F*** Off to Number One. Let's have a listen first before we talk to the author and the songwriter, Dominic Frisby. 17 million f*** offs. A general election was finally called. I think you know where we told them to go. We won't need to hear from them ever again. From Tony Blair, John Major, John Burko. I can't tell you how much pleasure it gives me to say that. Joe Swinson, lol. All the MPs who switch parties without holding a by-election. Chukarumana, Sarah Wollaston, Anna Subri, not a Nazi. All the MPs who did the opposite of what they promised in their manifestos. Dominic Grieve, David Gork, Philip Hammond, Oliver Letwin, Ed Vasey. All those patronising Labour MPs who know so much better than you, Emily Thornbury, Diane Abbott, Jess Phillips, that weird one with glasses, Jeremy Corbyn, oh bless, Hilary Benn, 
Hillary's a girl's name, what's that all about? The Civil Service, the Bank of England, the People's Vote, the EU, Eva Hofstad, Emmanuel Macron, most of Hackney, Bent Judges, the Commentariat, James O'Brien, Jolly on Moron, the BBC, Andrew Marr, Femi Weirdo, Aaron Bastani, Gina Miller, all the celebrities, Hugh Grant, Gary Lineker, Lily Allen, Steve Coogan, Nish Kumar, Lord Adonis. The British told you to f*** off. 17 million f*** offs. Dominic Frisbee, welcome to the Red Lion Pub. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, it's quite a song. Yeah. Um, this is a historic pub for me, by the way. Is it? Because Go I'm, on, ran, tell I'm me. very good friends with Steve Baker. You're, yes, And I remember He's running... the chairman in, of the ERG. A chairman of the ERG. Correct. And I remember running into Steve two days before the referendum result, just in the street, and he said, oh, I'm absolutely exhausted. Do you fancy coming for a pint? So we came in here and had a pint. And at this point, nobody believed that the Leave side would two win. Two days before the vote. In two days before the vote. Wow. And Steve was like, no, we're going to win. We're definitely going to win. I know we're going to win. And I just thought this was standard, like a CEO talking up his yeah, company, yeah. you know, to get people to buy his stock. But he's like, and, and he was just utterly, he said, I just know we're going to win. And he was right. He's a man, of faith. man of faith, isn't he? So he gets yeah, convictions. He he does. Well, I was down on the on the south coast at Bournemouth with Michael Gove and Penny Mordaunt and Connor Burns in a in that in the bus with a number on the side. And I did a tweet saying, if this happens, it's the biggest up yours by the British people to the bosses, to the economists, the celebrities, the pol- leaders, the church leaders. It's since exactly the, what it since was. It's a peasant, it was, re- peasant re- revolt. It was the peasants' revolt, and it was a massive up yours. Hence the hence the title is, of this well, song. And this this song, um, it, it's uh, how's it going in the charts? Is it gone anywhere? Well, it's at number forty. At okay, the moment, right. which is pretty good in the sales charts. The official charts is slightly different, and Lord knows That's how they go. Downloads ca- too, well, is it? Streams, streams and downloads, and 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 the people who buy this song are not the people who stream. Like if my daughter, for example, will stream everything and buy nothing. Oh, whereas the people who buy this song are probably more likely to be over forty, probably Brexiteers, or over over eighty if you <laughs> read the Guardian. <laughs> but no, but you know, and and Brexiteers, so. So it's 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 weirdly calculated, but we've got to the top forty. Um, but we need, you know, we just need loads of people to buy the single, and it will go go to number one. Yeah, and and what inspired it? We played an excerpt there, didn't we? But it's quite a long song. What inspired it? Well, is it anger. Um, Why are you angry? <laughs> if you are angry, or is it celebrating? I, well, I, I, but this is actually we. Act, I actually wrote the song l- last March when I thought we were leaving. And I have this, I have a ukulele March, lesson. Ninth, March, first yeah, exactly. And um, I have a ukulele teacher and we were just talking about it. And I was just, I said, I've got this idea for a song where they said, you know, you're going to lose your home. And the English said, up yours. And they said, there's going to be a stock market collapse. And the English said, up yours and so on. And, and we started just playing around with it in my ukulele lesson. And he said, you know what would lend itself very well to this is the old Uncle Tom Cobbley, which is an old Devon folk song. Mm. And so hence... We did it to the to the music of Uncle Tom Cobbley, <laughs> which is another reason because it's a very traditional English song. It's it another is. reason it works so well. You're performing your song uh, next week yeah. at Nigel Farage's celebration in Parliament Square. Uh, I don't think it's just Nigel's. I think it's Leave. I uh, think it's it, Leave means so Leave. Leave means Leave. Cross yeah, party, blah, blah, blah. It's always, because t- he's such a big name in the world of oh, Brexit, okay. it's, a t- it's tied to him. You're absolutely right. It's a cross party. Leave means Leave party. Um, you'll be singing your song. Will you yeah. be swearing on Parliament Square? Well, apparently. Churchill's watching you, don't forget. <laughs> I'm sure Churchill will support industrial land. Language. I'm, I bet he used it behind the scenes. But nevertheless, I've been warned that if I do, we can't swear because technically it's, I, I'm going to get this wrong, but technically it's a political event, not a, okay. an entertainment event, and you're not allowed to swear. And so if I swear, I will be done for a, 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 a public order, arrest for a swearing. public order offence for swearing, which would be very funny and generate a lot of publicity in itself. So it's very tempting to do just for the publicity, but, but I don't want to get. Um, no. that the organisers in trouble so I will be finding fudge. the audience will know well I'll either say fudge, fudge or I'll say feck I'll off. say feck or buck but the audience will know when the F word is coming so I might at that point simply point the microphone <laughs> to the audience and let let the authorities arrest 17 million people yes. <laughs> let them try there's going to be 20,000 people in the square 20,000 I was supposed to be doing a big talk in South Africa for which I was being paid a lot of money in Cape Town but then they phoned me up and said you don't want to do this and I just remember thinking Parliament Square Brexit Day how big is the fee you've turned down for Brexit uh, it's a lot of money 
It's costing you in a pocket, isn't it? It's costing, uh, yeah. And people, the other thing about all these songs that I do is they're a huge loss making exercise. <laughs> it's really hard to make money as an artist. I've got to ask so. you because Boris Johnson has a big idea about Brexit is, is it doesn't exist after we leave. It's not he a definitely word. He's brushing it under the carpet, isn't he? Yeah. And how does your song help unite the nation? I don't think that song helps unite the nation. I think it unites 52% of the nation. And that's and okay the, for and, you. And, the, and the, the many people that have. I think more people would, if we did the vote again, I think more people would vote leave this time because just so many people have, you know, it's a bit like The Wizard of Oz. The curtain's been pulled back and everyone's realised what goes on behind the scenes. It's not gloating though, is it? I mean, is it more of just celebrating the moment that people spoke? That's the point of the song, isn't it? It's a happy song. And you'd be, you know, I do it in clubs and people on both, you know, comedy clubs tend to be, you know, 80% remain. But it, I think even those on the remain side can see that the Brexit vote was a big up yours vote. And therefore the mm. song does work in regular comedy clubs. But it gets bigger laughs from a leave crowd than it does in a <laughs> remain crowd for sure. And Dominic Frisby, how can listeners get hold of your song? Well, we think it would be absolutely wonderful if this song could go to number one for January the 31st. We think it would be extremely amusing that uh, the likes of the BBC would be forced to play that song. And it's number and 40 in the charts. It's the number moment. 40 in the sales charts at the moment. I'm giving uh, away all the profits I'll give to the Maggie Oliver Foundation, which is uh, to help the victims of the child rape gangs. And for some reason... A purchase of the single is equivalent to a thousand streams. I don't quite know why that is. So if you actually buy the single, it gives the song a much better chance of going to number one. And you would buy it uh, on Amazon or at iTunes or any of those places. You just click on buy the single and it costs 79 or 99p. Dominic Fisby, good luck next week. And Thank even you. though you're giving away thousands of pounds to do it, enjoy the, enjoy the show. I w- Parliament Square, Brexit Day, me performing a gig. I don't think life gets much better than that. If you'd told me that a year ago, that I'd be doing this, I would never have believed you. Dominic Fisby, thank you. Right, that's your lot for today. Thank you very much to my guests, Sybil Cash, Rory Stewart, Peter Wilding and Dominic Frisby. Thanks to the show's producers, Theo Lulis and Elliot Lampett. Huge thanks to you for listening. If you've enjoyed this show, please do go to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star rating and a review. That really helps other people find this podcast. If you want to get in touch, do tweet us at Brexit Broadcast or email us choppersbrexitpodcast at telegraph.co.uk. We've had some great suggestions for new names for the show after Brexit. Keep them coming. And if you're all caught up on the podcast and fancy more world-class Brexit analysis, go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper, where you can find all the best Telegraph analysis and subscription deals. And finally, always, always buy your copy of the Daily Telegraph. Until next time, cheerio! Cheerio!